Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Kyle Bauer is visiting with Brian Klippenstein with Protect the Harvest. Then enjoy this week's Kansas soybean update. Next is Dwayne Taves and Elmer Runnebaum with the Kansas Rural Water Association. Then it's this week's Angus Report, and we'll end with Plain Talk featuring Kyle and Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first, Kyle Bauer and Brian Klippenstein with Protect the Harvest. Talk about why the organization was developed and how it defends against the activist groups when it comes to food security. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer visiting with Brian Klippenstein. He's with Protect the Harvest. Brian, let's start with who is or what is Protect the Harvest? Protect the Harvest is a nonprofit that was stood up by uh, Forrest Lucas, uh, founder of Lucas Oil, uh, to fight for food security issues and to take on in the political cre uh, arena uh, those we uh, refer to these days as the uh, food police. And so when you're talking the political arena, would that involve legislation or would that involve uh, initiatives in states? Uh, largely initiatives, but we've been to, uh, in federal court. Uh, uh, we've been in, in uh, uh, before state government, federal government, uh, and just before the public at large. Uh, you know, the, you increasingly have uh, uh, groups that are well-funded. There is a lot of money these days and more to come in food politics. It used to be limited to trying to dictate uh, how farmers farm. Increasingly, what they're trying to do is control diets, control refrigerators, control what people eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, an emerging threat. And certainly, um, a lot of that is disguised uh, as animal rights issues or environmental issues when it's really about an agenda that's hidden. Uh, that's right. I, look, the... the when I have had discussions with this with uh, East Coast media recently, for example, uh, you know, what's the end game here? What, what's what's behind? And I'll say, well, look, they are what they're promoting is a vegan diet. Oh, well, that's silly. Well, it's not silly. You go to their website, and that's what they're for. I mean, we have Meatless Monday, right? We have six days to go. Mm -hmm. And anyone who wants to embrace any diet that they prefer, we don't object to. But when they try to impose it upon others, particularly using false pretenses, uh, we're going to go give them a fight. And, and I can see where you fill a gap in that when there's an initiative, let's say I'll, I'll pick on Missouri, um, and that might be difficult for people fighting that initiative in Missouri because they've never done it before, but you may have already fought that battle in three other states. Right, yeah, and, it, and it's, look, the, it's, the, the people in agriculture are good at producing. They've, they're good-natured people. Uh, they're uh, cooperative in nature. They're great at taking care of land and the animals. Uh, but, you know, uh, rough and tumble, bare knuckles politics uh, uh, it, it is not what they're great at. And well, and it takes a lot of money. Well, and that's where we're still short. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, agriculture, particularly big agriculture, is going to have to come to grips with this. Because winning these things is a choice. It takes an investment. Uh, and I'm among those who think that if they care about their own business, they care about their, their uh, suppliers, they care about their customers, they care about sound, sound science, they are going to invest, and so far they've decided not to. We're visiting with Brian Klippenstein. He's with Protect the Harvest. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Hi, I'm Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. 
Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Dr. Terry Griffin, cropping systems economist at Kansas State University. And Dr. Griffin, living in rural areas means continued struggles concerning connectivity, broadband availability, and big data, especially for those involved in agriculture. What do you see as some of the underlying issues? There's several underlying issues when it comes to wireless broadband connectivity in rural areas. One of the leading ones is just a lack of hard wires going out to the rural areas, whether it's for hospitals, public schools, and different communities. We'll need fiber or wires going to those areas. And once that's established, that doesn't mean that we're going to have wireless connectivity in those areas, and especially farms, because that will require wireless providers. So that's been one of the limiting factors we've seen in rural areas, is that we can't just put a wireless tower in the middle of nowhere without a wire, because, you know, that's, you know equivalent to buying an ice machine without hooking it up to water. If you have some in that area, is there still a significant gap between upload speeds and download speeds that we see in rural areas? There is, and not just rural areas, but also in urban areas as well, because internet service providers calibrate the upload and download speeds in favor of download because most people in residential areas do more download than upload. For instance, you know, think about what you do at home. You're streaming video and looking at content on the internet. In agriculture, especially in the field, we are collecting data from sensors, uh, from lots of different farm equipment, and pushing it up. So we download very, very little, and the files that we do download in the field are relatively small. But we're trying to push some relatively large files up to the cloud. And so in agriculture, if we had to choose between upload and download speeds, I would choose faster upload speeds than download. And is the technology getting better to where we can solve some of these things in the future? Yes and no. You've been hearing about 5G replacing 4G. It's much faster. Although it's faster, it has a shorter distance that it's viable. So if you think about the wireless routers that you have in your home, many of the newer ones will have a 5G option. And so my router is in my basement. It works pretty good. And so it sends out a 5G and a regular connection. My uh, 5G does not work always upstairs or in the backyard, but my regular connection does. The regular connection is much slower, but it has a longer distance. The technology is getting better and faster, but the range from the towers may be getting smaller. That is Dr. Terry Griffin, cropping systems economist at Kansas State University, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more with Dwayne Taves and Elmer Runnebaum with Kansas Rural Water Association. What if U.S. soybean oil were an industry sensation? If end users started asking for it by name? That future is here, the time is now. To meet customer demands, the Soybean Checkoff is investing in varieties that produce oil with increased functionality. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. What does a brighter, more sustainable future look like in our cities and towns, and how do we get there? 
When New York needed an alternative fuel source to reduce carbon emissions, the city found what it needed in biodiesel made from U.S. soybean oil. Summer is busy at Tarwater Farm and Home. We have just about everything you'll need for your summer projects and we're consistently competitively priced. Tarwaters can help make your grass and garden grow. And we have a huge variety of equipment to cut it. If you have a farm, Tarwaters has the products and equipment to keep it going strong. And our expanded parking lot will make it even more convenient to shop. So come see us at Tarwater Farm and Home in Topeka. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now Dwayne and Elmer Runnebaum talk about the importance of maintaining a good foundation of rural water and how their association helps do that. Dwayne Tames joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and a chance to catch up with Elmer Runnebaum with the Kansas uh, Rural Water Association. Uh, Elmer, tell us a little bit about uh, the organization and, and what you do for folks across the state of Kansas. Uh, Kansas Rural Water Association provides training and technical assistance for cities and rural water systems. We work with uh, municipal water and wastewater utilities, providing many uh, training sessions annually across the state, about 100 days of training, which is attended by uh, roughly 6,000 operators of water and wastewater utilities. I want to talk a little bit about uh, an opportunity that you had uh, recently to, to testify in Washington, D.C. about how critical it is for support, particularly for our rural communities in Kansas, to have access uh, to the funds that help us keep our wastewater and water systems going. Yes, I was asked by uh, Senator Roberts, invited to the Senate Ag Committee to comment on the Farm Bill. One of the components of the Farm Bill is uh, a loan and grant program which has been managed by the USDA Rural Development Agency for more than 40 years. It's the program that actually built most of the rural water systems in the state. Uh, I went there because of the president's budget had proposed total elimination of that. Uh, that program provided funding for many communities in Kansas in the past year. Presently the agency has 49 applications on file. The benefit of that program is that it allows a 40-year amortization, and without that longer period of amortization, uh, many of the communities that are obtaining financing for water and or wastewater improvements would not be able to afford the rates if you compress that down to a 20-year amortization. We think about uh, why that's important. Uh, it's real dollars when it comes to the folks uh, when they look at their water and wastewater uh, bill that they get from the city. At Strong City recently was part of a new public wholesale water system. Uh, Strong City made some improvements also. Had Strong City not received the grant benefits and had they had to go to a 20-year amortization, the water rates in Strong City would have had to quadruple to nearly $25 per thousand gallons. It would have made uh, 5,000 gallons of water cost $157, and that's simply not affordable. We think about uh, what your organization does, uh, a lot of trainings and work with our uh, particularly rural communities across the state of Kansas and, and uh, situations where they don't always have uh, the most up-to-date equipment and such. Uh, you're there to help them out in that regard as well. We have uh, operators uh, who have been with systems who are staff members. We have 18 staff members. They've dealt uh, with all the sorts of regulatory issues and compliance with the regulations, but more so the hands-on stuff when it comes to uh, a breakdown of a pump or a motor. Uh, a, we do excessive amount of water loss and leak detection for rural water systems and small communities. Many of the small communities have even part-time help or they have one or two operators and so they are not going to be able to maintain an inventory of all the parts. Uh, they'll give us a call, we send somebody out there immediately and we will either find uh, the help that they need, provide the help that they need and if not we'll go to a neighboring community or we have parts and pieces in, in our repair trucks to uh, help them get back in, into operation. Our thanks to Elmer Runnebaum with the Kansas Rural Water Association joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. 
Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for this week's Angus Report. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there was a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I wanted to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not going to go out and dig trees and shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. As fourth-generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways, of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to KFB.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Angus Report. Adaptability isn't just about cattle that can survive in the cold or the heat. Sometimes it's just that they're able to safely digest the available forage. That's the case in the Red House, Virginia community, where Paul Bennett sells 400 Angus Gelbvi, Hereford, and hybrid bulls each year. Likely the greatest challenge we face is the fact that our primary forage is endophyte fescue. Kentucky 31 fescue, so uh, we basically have to create cattle that are adapted to fescue. We do not have the option, we believe, of changing our environment to adapt to the cattle. So our greatest environmental challenge with respect to beef cattle production would be creating and, and having cattle that will work on hot fescue. The producer is not big on second chances in his culling criteria. Well, we just work with Mother Nature and we let her be part of the selection process. We try not to manage problems out of our cattle, but rather let Mother Nature work with us in identifying the cattle that will truly excel in that environment and reproducing those cattle and eliminating the cattle that uh, are not capable of producing in that environment. Adaptability is number one for his customers. But Bennett can tackle that and other traits in tandem. He says, for example, he relies on genetic diversity to move the needle on growth and carcass quality. In the Angus breed, we have a, a big, broad population to select from. And we do believe that it's important that we utilize the entire population to select our genetics from. And in an effort not necessarily to have cattle that are extreme in any trait, but balanced and complete in a multitude of traits, we find that it's, it's not necessarily easy, but it's very doable to create Angus cattle that excel at multiple traits and also uh, thrive in our fescue environment. It's just a matter of using all available data to create the very best cattle. I'm Bob Cervera. Stay tuned. After the break, it's Plain Talk with Kyle and Dwayne. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is suretropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at suretropfertilizers.com. 
And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. With nearly 100 years of broadcasting excellence, Wren Radio is now live on the Internet playing hit songs of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Join Jack Diamond, Matt Collins, Les Glenn, Frankie C., Antonio Barber, Wings Callahan, and the real Don Steele for some of the best music ever recorded. Hear it at wrendigitalmedia.com or get the Wren Oldies Radio app in Play Store or App Store. And tell Alexa, good times and great oldies on Wren Internet Radio. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back to Farm Factor. Let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to today on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with Dwayne Taves. Kyle Bauer, your fact or fiction question of the day. Over a thousand birds a year die from smashing into windows. Fact or fiction? Oh, I bet it's more than that. I think there's half that many just at our house. My wife likes to keep her windows clean. Yeah. Most brutal thing you can it's do to birds. the worst thing you can do to a bird. Oh, my gosh. They're whacking into those windows. All, over a 1,000, sure. Absolutely. That's Yeah, that's what it says. I would bet it's more like 50,000 or 100,000. I think that's a very conservative figure. Well, seriously, I bet I see three or four a year that don't survive around our house. There's a lot of them that whack the window and, and don't die. That's the ones that you see before the neighbor cat right. carts them off. Right, yeah. and But there's a lot of them whack the window. What cr- drives me crazy is they'll whack the window and turn around do it and they'll again. turn around and do it again. <laughs> Did you learn anything? Were you here when we had that cardinal, that male cardinal, that was attacking that other cardinal out here on my on my uh, w- um, rear view window, rear view mirror of my truck. No. He was sitting on that, and he was just attacking the heck out of the cardinal that was in his territory uh, that he saw the reflection. In the mirror. He did it himself. for a week. <laughs> a week. And he was defecating all over the the uh, area. He was scraping up the window. Well, not permanently, but, you yeah, know. Scratching and he, he did that for a week until, uh, I don't know, maybe he got tired, or number two, thought he wasn't going to win, or number three, some cat found him panting over there in the weeds <laughs> and ate him. But that darn bird, he made a mess for a week. I, no, and I, I must have been and I went I and ran him off a few times, but it didn't matter. It came right. He come right back. Could have and it was bag. only on my pickup. Could have put a bag over your mirror. Well, it wasn't the mirror he's seeing himself in. He was sitting on the mirror and seeing him in the glass. Seeing himself in the glass. Oh, I thought yeah. maybe he actually was looking in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, hey, I got a chance to go through a cotton gin here back a little ways. And um, very interesting. But I, I did some research on the cotton gin then. Okay. Do you know who invented the cotton gin? Um, Eli Whitney. I figured that was too. I mean, honestly, I, I wouldn't yeah. expect you to pull that up that fast. Well, it turns out Eli Whitney probably didn't invent the cotton gin. He's the gin. one that patented it. He was the one who patented it. By the way, his patent number was 71. Really? Or was it 72? Right in there somewhere. That's a pretty low number. That's a pretty low number. He did it in 1793, I think, or something like 1794. You know, there must have been some business people in charge of government at that point in time that saw the need for that. For a patent? Yeah. Yeah, that is pretty, because our country was pretty young. Yeah, and to think had they not... Yeah, put that in place. It, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it is there what, have been no encouragement to innovation, research, and, and development. Right, R and D. You're right. It was very, but um, so before the the cotton gin came along, a person slash slave could separate about a pound of cotton from the trash a day. Huh. A pound. That's okay. not very much. And afterwards, the hand cranked one could do about fifty pounds a day. Okay. Okay. So, would that increase the use in the number of slaves needed or decrease the number of slaves needed? Actually, it uh, would increase the number. How's that? Because they needed more of them picking it in the field, and you had a machine capable of much more efficient means. You're to exactly right. I had no idea, but it you know, actually. That's interesting because most actu- people will think that a I, machine taking over a human's job creates less jobs for humans well and it Not made always. it and it made it possible to raise more acres then of cotton sure. and so the slave trade actually went up hugely huh. after the cotton gin exactly the opposite of what i would have thought thanks for joining us i'm your host jamie bloom and i hope you enjoyed today's show see you next week on farm factor 
closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.